Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. We are the New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. We are located at number one North Dade, Ferguson, Missouri, 63135. Uh, we bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and we are so grateful to be able to come to you today uh, from our home location. We're asking that you will please be in prayer with us as we had uh, somewhat of a dilemma on Sunday. For those who were watching with us, uh, we had a pipe that burst um, in the church, caused a little bit of damage. Thankfully, we were able to catch it early, and by catching it, uh, we were able to keep from having uh, some very heavy sustainable damage. But nevertheless, uh, we have yet to get the uh, adjuster out and the repairman. So, uh, we are currently without water in the building, but we're not complaining. Once again, we are grateful. Uh, with that being said, uh, we're not having service in the building tonight, so we are coming from our home location. Um, want to say good evening to all of those who will be checking in. As a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and uh, uh, make sure so we are... Very heavy, sustainable of course, this is loud. So, uh, we've been talking about the prayer, the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked him how to pray. That started uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. And, of course, I already kind of had planned out how I wanted this to go and... Um, <clears throat> I remember our teaching from before when we went through uh, what we call the disciples prayer. So I really kind of had in my mind how we wanted to do this. And the more I began to study, some other things came out and it has really kind of taken us for a turn. So uh, there are some greater things that I want to bring. So we're going to go uh, a little bit further into that discussion, I want to say good evening to my sister, uh, Asia, uh, to my mother, uh, Mother Adams, and to Bishop Adams. I'm grateful for you all tuning in with us. It does say that we have five people who are watching this currently, and those numbers are getting higher. Uh, we ask that if you all will please uh, share this video uh, with, uh, I don't know how you share it, whether you do it by hosting the watch party or just sharing it. But we, we want to get this word out. We certainly appreciate you all tuning in with us. But there is so much. The word of God is so deep. Uh, it truly is uh, the words by which we live by. Uh, it is not just our uh, food for the day. Uh, no pun intended on what we're going to be reading and talking about. But uh, I just want to bring you in on what this word is saying. And then I also want to kind of clue you in first probably on what it's not saying. So let's read. Uh, if you all will, uh, get your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. And this is where we get one of the renditions of Jesus speaking to his disciples as he is teaching them to pray. Uh, it says, after this manner, starting at verse 9, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Our verse for tonight, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. Uh, the words that, that we are going to focus on tonight is, give us this day our daily bread. Now, um, I don't know if you all recall, but back in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel had left from Egypt, uh, they were complaining about being hungry, and uh, they were talking to Moses over and over and over, and they were telling Moses, we 
have been brought out here to die. Uh, you took us from the only place that we have known as home, and we are starving, we are thirsty. And God told him, or told them, uh, through Moses, that he would provide. One morning they woke up and there was manna or bread from heaven that was given to them. So, um, in this instance, Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, the bread was meant sufficient for the day. Give us enough bread for today to feed us for today. Now, that goes right in line with the manna that was given from heaven. Uh, Moses told them to eat all that you need uh, for today, but don't try to take any for tomorrow. And there were some that were disobedient that maybe thought that God would not provide for the next day. And they tried to take some and hide it and, and, and save it. And it spoiled. Uh, it had maggots in it. Uh, God made sure that they trusted him for the day. So let's, let's talk about what this could be saying or uh, even more so what maybe it's not saying. There are a lot of people who, who say we need to have faith that, that God is going to sustain us. So some people are teaching that we should only live for today. That, uh, you know, uh, go, if you will, let's see. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's, let's, let's go there first. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 25 through 34. Some people are saying that this verse is all about the food. Give us this day our daily bread. We know that a big part of the meals uh, back in uh, the Aramaic, Greek times, uh, Old Testament times, they used bread a lot. Bread was a big part of almost every feast. Uh, uh, for the Passover, they used unleavened bread. But whenever somebody would come over and visit, there was always bread made because it was uh, uh, readily available to have the wheat and, and what it take to, to bake that. But I, I'm believing that uh, the word of God will not contradict itself. And if the word won't contradict itself, then I, I want to take you to this passage of scripture Again, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought, we're reading from the King James Version, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on it. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, or are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment or your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all, these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So this is what I want to kind of talk to you about for just a few minutes. Um... With Jesus telling us to give us this day our daily bread, I don't think that Jesus is talking about 
feeding us virtual food. Now, well, I mean, it, it says plain as day, though, you might be saying, uh, give us this day our daily bread. But so often the things that Jesus teach us is so much deeper than what's on the surface. But let's just say that he's not talking about food because he just said, your heavenly father knows what you have need of. Uh, why take any thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear? If God knows all of these things and says we don't have to ask God for the things that we need because he already knows. And the Bible teaches us before we would have even called that God would have already answered. So maybe then, if, if according to this, uh, he's not talking about eating. Also, uh, it says take no thought for tomorrow. So maybe he's just saying we should live day by day and we shouldn't think about tomorrow. Well, if, if we shouldn't think about tomorrow, then there are some other scriptures that I, I want to give. Because there are a lot of people who say, hey, I'm living for today. I'm living my best life and you only live once. Uh, live like there is no tomorrow. Well, if that was true. If we all truly live like there was no tomorrow, then there would be no need or reason for a savings account. If we all thought that we were going to die tomorrow or that tomorrow was not going to be there for us, we would take every bit of pleasure that we could and live for today. We would uh, 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 buy all of the food we want. We would drink all of the drink that we want. We would take all of the money and, and try to store it up or, or, or spend it on, on something that, that was truly pleasurable for us right now, we would literally live in the moment because we didn't think that there would be a tomorrow. Well, we all know that that's not what God intends for us to do. Uh, if he only wants us to live for today and not for tomorrow, then I, I would have to ask you uh, in Luke chapter 14, verse 28. <clears throat> Excuse me. Luke chapter 14, verse 28 says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth up the cost, whether you have sufficient enough to finish it? So God is saying through Jesus Christ talking to the people, which of you all if you were going to build something, wouldn't sit down and count up the cost. Well, we all know that we can't build practically anything, any type of real structure in just one day. So we're going to think about what is it going to cost us for all of the building material, what is going to cost us for all of the labor that's involved, and we are setting aside a budget. Budgeting because we do believe that tomorrow, even though tomorrow is not promised to us, but we are going to make sure that we are thinking of tomorrow, not just thinking of today. So the, the person who might be thinking that uh, Jesus wants us to just live for today and not tomorrow, there is another scripture that I would like to bring to you uh, that I believe could also help dispel that thought that uh, we're only thinking about today. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Again, we're going to read this from the King James Version, and it says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. That's part A. That's, that's the verse that, that we really want to complete. Now, the second part, which is still part of verse 22, says, The wealth of the wicked or the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. But I really want to focus on clause A. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children or his grandchildren. If we were only living for today, then we would not be putting up anything for tomorrow or let alone not just our children. So I'm not just thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about the grandkids that I don't have yet. So as I live, as I'm trying to grow my business, as I am trying to uh, put money aside for uh, uh, our um life insurance policy, and all of that, I am making sure that not only am I leaving an inheritance for my children, 
but I'm also going to leave an inheritance for my grandchildren. So I am not just thinking about today. I'm not just thinking about tomorrow. I am literally thinking years from now, possibly uh, decades from now. So no, I don't think God wants us to just live for today and, and give us this day our daily bread. So, you know, if that makes any sense, if, if we understand what I'm saying here and, and you're in agreement, then let's try to look a little bit deeper at what we really might be saying. So, give us this day our daily bread. So let's 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 go back then to Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34. Now we were just in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, where, where Jesus gives us this prayer that he wants us to pray and recite. So just a few verses down. Starting in Matthew chapter 25, he says, don't take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. He said, life is more than meat. And if he doesn't want us to take thought for food, then what is this daily bread? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at John chapter 6. Verse 35. So right after verse 34, when he says, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take, or tomorrow shall take thought for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There is enough problems for today to keep us through today. But look at what the very next verse says. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So I am the bread of life. So if he says, give us this day our daily bread, let's just contemplate for a moment. What could he really be talking about? Now, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the other things will be added. So if I don't have to think about what I'm going to eat or what I'm going to wear, if I consider first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will add all of the food that I need, especially since he's already instructed us that we don't have to ask him for the things that we need because God already knows what we have need of. So maybe God give me Jesus Christ for today. Remember that the, the, the Bible taught us, Jesus speaks and he says that if any man wishes to follow me, he must first deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. So if we are going to pick up the cross of Christ, then we need to take on Jesus every single day. Paul said this, I have to die daily. Every day I crucify myself and not I, he says, but Christ that lives in me. So every day I have to put Christ in me. Every day I have to receive my daily dose of the daily bread. As a matter of fact, it just came to my mind. There is a, a book that comes out and in it, it has a book of daily devotions and it is called Our Daily Bread. If the word of God is truly the bread of life and we need to have this on a daily basis, some of us are going through so many things. We're dealing with so many different uh, problems and situations and, and so much that's going on. If you don't put God as part of your daily life, we will fail. Now, I have to make mention that as, as we go into verse 11 of give us this day our daily bread, that the, the first part of the prayer, uh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, uh, those first verses are what is actually considered the thou petitions. So this is 
uh, the request that we make to God for him to do something that makes his name known, that proclaims his greatness and furthers his purpose. Now, as we go from verse 11 until the conclusion, these are considered the we petitions. It is in these final three requests that we are offering up to God to relate to the here and now world that we live in. So now we've completed what, what we are asking God to do, and now we are talking about what we need to do. And the idea that God speaks and he says uh, through his son, give us this day our daily bread. Normally, in the very beginning, uh, we see that God is not concerned with just us. This is not a selfish prayer. When Jesus starts, he started with our Father. Even though we are praying, even though we are praying as individuals, he could have said, my Father which is in heaven, but he says, our father. All of this, God is always trying to get us to think more than just ourselves. This is not about me, mine, uh, my. This has always been about us. Us, what can we do for each other? Give us God. Don't just give me uh, my daily bread, but give us this day our daily bread. So many of us are concerned about just me. We'll, we'll, we'll go and, and, and there we have loved ones who are, who are in the hospitals and we'll pray, God, go into my my, my mother's room, go into my father's room, go into my, my wife's room, my children's room, uh, and, and, and bless them. God, heal them. But that is such a selfish, we will overlook the other 8,000 people, 10,000 people, how many people are in that particular hospital or all of the hospitals, the millions that are in hospitals and, and, and care facilities around the world, and we will pinpoint our own people. Lord, go uh, into Christian Northwest or Christian Northeast Hospital. Go to uh, the fourth floor uh, in room 323, first bed, and make it all about the one person. Lord, bless me. Help me to get a job. Help me to get a car. Help me to get a house. Help me, help me, help me. And, and we don't think about how many other people are in need of help. So here, once again, uh, Jesus is, is not focusing on just the me and my, not just my father, but our father, not just, Lord, give me today my daily bread, but give us our daily bread. Now, with saying that, in, 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 in Philippians, he says, I will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Understand that us praying to God for us and our is unselfish, but it also says that there is a level of faith that God has enough to go around. This is not just about uh, God only having enough for me. God took one man, one seed, one, his only begotten son, and through the death of one man, God saved a whole world, a whole nation, all of those from before him to all of those who will come after him. Jesus Christ is enough. There is so much of him to go around. We don't have to just take him and hide him and, 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 and keep him to ourselves. As a matter of fact, the word of God says to go ye into all of the nations and all of the worlds, first Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost part of the world, and declare Jesus Christ. 
there is enough of Jesus to go around. We don't have to be selfish. Uh, we don't have to think that, that just one denomination has the rights to him. No, uh, uh, he, he's not just the Baptist Jesus. He's not just the Church of God in Christ Jesus. He's not just the Apostolic Jesus, the Pentecostal Jesus, the Catholic Jesus, uh, the Protestant, the, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the AME, none of those. He is Jesus for all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. He remembers and, and he tells us, church, I'm coming back after a church, one church without a spot or a blemish. Jesus Christ is enough. We can share in this daily bread. I remember uh, even during the Last Supper, the Bible says he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and then he began to give it out. Now, before this Last Supper, he had just told the people, you will eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Now, if, if he was really talking cannibalism, out of all of the people in the world, there is not enough of one person to be able to feed the whole world if he was speaking literally of his flesh. But him being the bread of life, he said, my words are spirit, my words are life. And, and, and when he's speaking, so the word of God, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, went through the Bible in a year or the Bible in two or three years, but uh, I guarantee you that even if you have read the Bible all the way through, there is no way. Oh, excuse me. I don't know why every time we start talking about praying, I, I get to yawning. Almost like it's bedtime. I don't know why we pray and, and we think that there is not enough of God to go around. Uh, as, as we talk about uh, him being the word of God from Genesis to Revelations, if you have read through that Bible, I don't care how many times you've read through it, you will see, Lord, I missed something. Or, or sometimes, even if you know that you've read through the Bible, you will read something and go, oh my God, I've never seen that. Why? Because the word of God is living. It comes to life in us. Even though you may have read it before, Trust me, there is so much to God, you can never get enough and you can never fully digest all of him. He is, he is too much encompassing. Uh, he's just too wide. The, the, the song that says, uh, he's so wide you can't go around him. He's so high you can't go over him. He's so low you can't go under him. You have to go through the door. You have to go through him. Uh, he's just too big. God is, is all inclusive. Jesus Christ is the word of God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We are speaking of our savior, Jesus Christ. So let's, let's, let's talk more about this daily bread. Um, there's so much that that comes to this idea of God being the daily bread. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Life is, is what we need to be sustained. There is no way that we can live. There is no way that we can truly uh, move and have our being without Jesus Christ our daily bread, the bread of life, what we have to ingest. Remember, the word of God teaches us that it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out that defiles the man. I want to tell you that you are what you eat. How we live and, and, and how we eat has a whole lot to do with what, uh, what kind of essentials. If all you are eating is junk food, then it's, it's going to be hurtful to you when you have not eaten what we call a balanced diet 
from the five essential food groups. One of those food groups, of course, is bread. But here God is saying all we need is the bread of life. I am the bread. I am meat for you. You don't have to take any thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought of itself. But think about today. Remember that we need to, to take Jesus Christ on our daily walk. We need to continue to ingest him. We need to continue to eat him. Uh, uh, all of the things that we do, we have to think about this for today. I want to go back and, and reiterate these verses Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. Take no thought for your life. Why? Because God says, I have sustained you. I'm carrying you. If you are concerned about your life, then brothers and sisters, there's going to come a day where, where you're going to have to give up your life. And, and remember this, that God doesn't want you necessarily to die for him. Now, I do believe there's going to come a day where somebody is going to say, you're going to have to choose uh, to live or you're going to denounce Christ. And in that instance, I'm hoping that all of us will be able to say, I choose Christ, no matter what the cost is. But God doesn't want us to die for him. He wants us to live for him. So, if we're concerned about our life, then we are not living for God. We are not living for Christ. We are not living to proclaim Jesus. We are only concerned about what we do. And, and brothers and sisters, I got to tell you, there is no way that you can truly live for Christ when you are worried about your life. Your life includes your thoughts, your feelings, your pride, all of these different kind of things. Those things are vanity. All of those things result in vanity. It is vain. It is about me thinking of me and me only. Once again, we just said God is not about me. Remember that he says that uh, all of the gifts, even our gift, your gift will make room for you and bring you before good men. But the whole purpose of your gift is to give to others. Give and it shall be given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not so that he could just say he gave his son, but so that people would believe on him and have the right to the tree of life, everlasting life. Every gift is for the betterment of the kingdom. Remember and and. uh Ephesians 4, where he says, and he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of those things that were given, all of those things that he gives us. Remember the Lord your God who have given you the power to get wealth so that his covenant can be established. Everything that God gives us is for the purpose of the whole body, not just us. Remember that we are part of a body. So it's never been just about us. The hands are, are not just sustaining the hands. The hands pick up the food so that it can go to the mouth, so that it can go through the throat, into the stomach, into the digestive system to give the entire body nourishment. We are here to nourish the whole body. Jesus Christ, the bread of life for all of us to live. Huh. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or, or not what you shall wear. Uh, and he talks about the fowls of the air. They don't sow, neither do they reap, uh, nor do they gather into barns. Now here is God talking about gathering into barns because he knows that we as people, uh, barns represent the savings account. Barns represent the overflow. Barns represent what I'm not going to eat today or what I'm not going to be able to store today. I'm storing it for tomorrow, the barns. Uh, 
I believe it was Proverbs where he said, uh, in your first fruit offerings, that your barns would be filled with plenty. If God is talking about us having barns and understanding that barns don't represent or, or, or barns are not meant for today, they are for tomorrow, then once again, that is dispelling the idea that uh, God doesn't want us to live with tomorrow in mind. So uh, these barns, uh, the birds are not gathering into them. They are feeding themselves from today because they know that God is going to provide. How many of us have enough faith in God to know that God is going to provide not only for today, but also for tomorrow? We have to, everything revolves around faith. Faith is so important. Faith is paramount as a believer. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm saying you're a believer. In order to believe, you have to have faith. You cannot even believe in this word of God. You can't believe in Jesus Christ. You've never seen him. You cannot believe in God. You've never seen him. Many of us have to believe that when we die, there is an afterlife. There is uh, uh, hell if we have not accepted Christ or heaven if we have accepted Christ. All of this is a matter of what we believe. It is a matter of faith. So believing in Jesus Christ is a matter of faith. Remember in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everything that we are talking about, excuse me, talking about requires faith. So as, as we are going through, I want you to, to, to think about this. Lord, I know that you are not only going to give me what I need today, you are also going to take care of my tomorrow. Now, I understand he said, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought of itself. But I'm trusting God that the God of today will carry me, if there is a tomorrow for me, will carry me to tomorrow. And God, even if tomorrow does not include me, I believe that you are going to take care of my family. You are going to take care of my loved ones. You are going to take care of the things that I started on today. But I'm going to live today fully. I am going to live today completely. I am not going to leave anything on the table. I'm going to make sure that not only am I asking God for this daily bread, but I also know that in this daily bread, comes forgiveness. I'm going to make sure that I'm not, the Bible says, don't go to bed angry. Don't go to bed in your wrath to ask God for forgiveness. So Lord, anybody who have wronged me today, I forgive them today. I'm not going to carry that into tomorrow. So many people are holding grudges. I, 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 I know we haven't gotten to the part where it talks about forgiving us, our trespasses, but I, I, I need to, to talk to you about living today. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of us are still holding on to yesterday's stale crackers? Yesterday's staleness. Uh, uh, we are holding on to grudges from years ago. You all, there are some people who have totally despised us. And continue to hold problems and 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 all that's not God's way. I know this. God says that if you have an art with your brother to go to that one, many of us are living with people in our own homes and refuse to have conversation. That is against the will of God. The Bible says, uh, even with, with, our, with our brothers and with our sisters, how can you say that you love God but hate your brother, your sister? 
Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, I love you. And, and, and I don't hold anything. I don't hold any grudges. But once we have come and, and we have tried to make peace and, and, and we continue to do our due, uh, our due diligence to, to let go, then it's, it's on the person who's holding the grudge. They are going to have to give an account now. Do what God has instructed you to do. Live today. Live fully for today. Do everything. Have you done everything today that God has instructed you to do? When you go to bed tonight, have you everything that, that all of the scriptures that you ingested today? Give us this day our daily bread. I'm hoping that, that every day you are reading your word. To some degree. And if you are reading that word. If you are reciting that word. If you are meditating on that word. In, jo in the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. I believe it says. If you shall meditate on this book of the law. And it not depart from you. But you meditate on it day and night. Brothers and sisters. I'm hoping that, that this word. That you have put inside of your body every single day, that whatever that word gave you, that you have done it to the best of your ability every day. That when you go to bed, uh, your prayer to God is, Lord, I hope that I have completed the assignment that you put me on today. I am living on purpose. And, 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 uh, in Romans chapter 8, I believe it is Romans 8. Let's, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Lord, I'm hoping that I'm, I'm saying this right. <coughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 28. A very familiar passage. I, I had to I had so many things in my mind, but uh, thank God that the Word of God is truly hidden, uh, not just in the book, but the Word of God is hidden in your heart. Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-eight, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Are you living on purpose? God, everything that you have given to me, everything that you have told me to do, uh, everything that you have purposed me to do, I have done that to the best of my ability. The purpose-driven life is not just a book. It ought to be what you are living by. It ought to be what you strive for on a daily basis to live every day, our daily bread, live on purpose. Many of us, some of us will, will, will have that little book called Our Daily Bread or we'll have a devotion and we'll read it and, and I don't understand why we are reading devotions and not doing what the Word of God have instructed us to do in that devotion. What is the purpose of reading your Word? What is the purpose of reading that book of life and then die to everything that it has told you to do? We have to be extremely careful that as the word of God, if, if we are taking this word to be our daily bread, that when we, at the end of the night, when we turn over to go to sleep, when, when we have spoken to God for the last time be, be, before he takes us off into sleep, that we have done everything that he has instructed us to do. So in this daily bread, as we read the word of God, what are we doing? And if we are so self-righteous that we think that God is pleased with us and, and, and we believe enough in our own righteousness to be able to go to sleep knowing that we have went to sleep with hate and, and contempt in our heart for our brothers. When Jesus said in the word of God that if there is any wrong in your heart to leave your gift at the altar and go and make restitution, go and repent and, 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 and make up 
with your brother or your sister, and then once you have reconciled, then come back and pick up your gift and present it. How many of us are presenting even our prayers at night and they are so tainted with hate? Our prayers are tainted with, with uh, contempt. It is a shame before God that we think that we are pleasing to God and will actually uh, have that self-righteous attitude when God is so unpleased with us. If you are that blind to your own faults, brothers and sisters, you need to check on your Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not only someone who comforts you, but he is your teacher. He is your moral compass. He is your Jiminy Cricket to Pinocchio. He is your conscience. And you mean to tell me that this daily bread, this Jesus that I'm taking, the Holy Spirit is not convicting me on, on what I'm thinking and what I'm believing to be self-righteous and you can sleep? Wow. Well, maybe that's why your, your, your life don't have a lot of effect on a lot of other people. You can actually turn your nose up at somebody else and walk away. I, I know I'm hitting somebody. I don't, I, I don't know who you are. I, I, it's all of us. Because all of us have had a problem at some point in time with somebody being a Christian and have went to bed thinking that we were justified because we were right. Somebody else was wrong. And we didn't try to help them in their wrong. And I don't mean help them do wrong, but while they were wrong to help them to, to see the word of God to be right. If you find someone in the fault, the Bible says, if you find someone in the fault, you should go to that one in the spirit of meekness. But no, you found them in the fault and you think that you were right and justified to just get bad and walk away. God, forgive us for our ignorance. May the Holy Spirit that convicts us try to get us to do right. This daily word, this, this bread of life, this, this, this God, this, this Son of God that we speak of, who gave his life for all of us in the middle of our wrong. Remember that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you are supposed to have that same Christ in you on a daily basis. And that Christ in you today did not tell you to make peace. It told you to keep hell. Okay. That's a lie. <laughs> Many of us are wondering about uh, uh, lie detectors. The word of God is a perfect lie detector. And... and let every man examine himself. I examine myself against the word of God. I don't examine myself against my pastor. I understand my pastor is a man just like I'm a pastor to my people, but I'm still a man. I examine myself based on Jesus Christ. I don't examine myself based on my family, based on my, my, my wife or my children or my dad or mom or brothers or sisters. All of us got problems. And when you live with somebody, you know more about their problems than anybody else. So I don't need you to, to, to wonder if I have a problem. I'm going to tell you up front. Sure I do. But that's why I'm asking you to look to the hills from which come of your help. All my help comes from the Lord. Look to the hills. Don't look to your pastor. Your pastor is not your daily bread. Jesus Christ is my daily bread. The word of God is my daily bread. I need us to, to want to be more like him. I'm grateful that, that years ago somebody came out with a saying, what would Alonzo do? Actually, that's wrong. The saying is, what would Jesus do? Because that's who I need to try to compare myself with. Even when Peter did Jesus wrong to, I mean, to the utmost, even Judas, to those who are in Christ, 
there is no condemnation. Jesus denied, or excuse me, Peter denied Jesus three times. When Jesus found them and, and, and they were uh, fishing, when they realized it was Jesus, Jesus brought them over and fed them. And then Jesus began to walk with them. And Jesus took Peter and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. This he asked Peter three times. Why? Well, I believe that three, three represents wholeness. Also, Peter denied Jesus three times. So Jesus restored him three times. Jesus made sure that when he left him, he was completely restored. He was whole, the number three. He was complete, the number three. And the three times that he denied him, he restored him all three times. Even though he was a sinner, even though he had done him wrong, Jesus made sure he did not leave here even Thomas, who doubted Jesus, had, had, had come back and returned even after all of the disciples. Jesus redeemed him and restored him. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. All those of us who have been redeemed, if you have been redeemed by God, then why should you not redeem others? This is, this is the faith that we have. This is this is what God is doing for us. God is, is, is taking us to a place where he can give us what we need on a daily basis. So many of us are, are living in fear of tomorrow. One of our close uh, neighbors his mother went into the hospital and um, when she came home, he told me that she was coming home on hospice care, that the, the doctors had given her somewhere between three to six months. That was uh, maybe two weeks ago. I, I don't even think it was three weeks ago. Maybe it was two, maybe it was less than two. But I, I, I talked to him on yesterday and, and I was waving at him and I asked him, hey man, how is your mom doing? He said, brother mom passed away this past Friday. I said, what? We, we just talked. We, uh, uh, you know, I just asked you and, 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 and I talked with him on Thursday. He came uh, and, and, and dropped off some Tupperware to us on Thursday. But the very next day, brothers and sisters, I think sometimes the doctor gives us a, a word of life or death, and we look to them for that death. They tell us death is coming, so we begin to look for it. And the Bible says, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And, and I'm not trying to, uh, by, by no means do I want to um, say that she caused death upon herself. That's not what I'm trying to do. And please, please don't mistake what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to to give to you, but many of us uh, are, are worried about tomorrow, and we worry so much that we cause those things to happen. We have faith for it. We believe that it's coming, and because we look for it, we find it. Many of us are worrying about tomorrow, and because we are worrying about tomorrow, we are not living for today. I'm worried about what I'm going to eat tomorrow instead of cooking my meal for today. I'm worried about uh, if, if my husband is going to leave me instead of loving on him today. I, I'm, I'm worried about uh, uh, if my kids are going to, to go to college and, and worry about their college tuition three years from now, but I'm not helping them with their schoolwork today. We have to stop procrastinating or uh, uh, going above and beyond for tomorrow when God has given us today. Let us live for today. We had this water problem and this water breakage 
on uh, Sunday. Again, grateful that we were in the building, but we have the insurance companies who are calling us and uh, we have the adjusters and we need to get work, excuse me, we need to get work done and uh, we, we, we have to get the contractors out there. But brothers and sisters, I haven't given it no more thought. We haven't went there to check to see if anything else have burst or we, we, we did everything that we were supposed to do. We turned the water off from the main. Uh, we drained all the water out. We made sure that the heat was on. We have the equipment there to try to dry everything out. Uh, there's only so much that we can do. We did what we were supposed to do that day. If you do what you are supposed to do today, today will carry itself and take care of the next day. Take no thought for tomorrow because God is in tomorrow. God is in the future. God holds our future. The only thing that we can do, brothers, sisters, yesterday is gone. There's nothing you can do about it. You, you, you cannot continue to worry about what you did on yesterday. You cannot continue to have regrets on what you did on yesterday. If you did something wrong yesterday, repent. Ask God for forgiveness and start fresh. Again, live for today. Give us today our day. Jesus Christ, help me to live right today. And that my, my, my right today will, will make for a better tomorrow. No, I'm not worried about tomorrow, but I do believe I'm praying that tomorrow has me included. I'm not taking it for granted. But I am going to make sure that if tomorrow comes, I've done everything that I need to do today to do uh, my work tomorrow. I'm going to make sure that I plant my seeds on today. I'm going to make sure that I plant my seed today so that there will be a harvest tomorrow. The harvest is plentiful. Why is the harvest plentiful? I don't know if you've ever given much thought to that scripture. God says the harvest is truly plentiful. But the laborers are few. How can the harvest be plentiful unless somebody days before put the seed in the ground? Remember that we are to put seeds in the ground. The Bible says one man planteth, one man watereth, but it's God who gives the increase. It's God who makes it grow. But after they grow, somebody got to go and pick them. They are just ripe for the picking. How many people have we led to Christ today? How many people did we try to reach out to and tell them how much Jesus Christ loves them? How much he gave his life for them? The whole purpose of the tree is the fruit. The tree of life. Jesus Christ, the tree of life, the bread of life. Everything revolves around Christ. But how many people, and I, I b b b b <laughs> believe me, I'm speaking to myself. I know how many people I walked past in the grocery store today, and I didn't ask them, excuse me, I, I don't mean any offense, but do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? How many people have we talked to on the phone that did we tell them that God loves them? Did we show the love of Christ? I mean, did we even bother to speak to someone? So much, in, so much so that do you realize that just speaking to somebody and showing love can plant a seed of Christ? Even though I didn't ask the people who I saw if they knew Jesus Christ, I smiled. I tried to be pleasant. I, I tried to give them uh, at least the love that was in my heart, the love that permeates from one heart to the next heart. I, I, I did try to reach out. So many of us are in places that God has put us. Why? Because there is a harvest around us. There are people around us that's ready to be picked. 
Remember that we are to, to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the vineyard. Brothers, sisters, you are the laborers. You are the workers. When you accepted Christ, you went from being the, the plant to being the picker. When somebody introduced you to Christ, then you were the harvest and they pulled you. They pulled you up out of the ground, out of that, that, that clay that you hear everybody, oh, he picked me up from the Maori clay and did what? Just set you on the shelf? No, once he picked you up out of that clay, once he brought you out of the dirt, once you went from being the harvest to being the picker, then now your job is to go back into that vineyard where you were once at and find somebody else who is just right for the picking. Give us this day our daily bread. There, there's, there's so much more. Um, I've, I've kind of veered away from the notes. I, 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 I want to kind of get back to our notes for just a second. Let's So Jesus is telling us, let's, let's get back to, to, the, to this word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <coughs> this is Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What words proceed out of the mouth of God? Well, if we go back to John chapter 1, it says... The word of God is Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh. We, 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 we say this so frequently. We say it over and over and over. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live, excuse me, shall live by the word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That daily bread, our daily bread is Jesus Christ. And that's what we are going to live by. That's what we need to be living by. And we need to make sure that we are not living just for us. Brothers and sisters, I believe in my heart that I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that when I die, I am going to heaven. I don't care how many people that will wish hell upon me. I don't care how many people have told me to go to hell. Uh, it doesn't matter. I believe heaven is my final destination. I believe that, that the work that I'm doing on my regular everyday job, that, that's, that's not you know my biblical job, not pastoring, but my job with my cleaning company, I believe that that business can make me very wealthy. But I'm not just living so that now, because I know Jesus Christ, that because I, I believe God wants me to have a victorious life and be more than conquerors and, and have more than enough, I'm not just living and, and doing my business so that I can get money and live a great life and die and go to heaven. That is not my purpose. My purpose is to find somebody else, which is why I'm preaching and I'm ministering to you, not because of what it gets me, because very frankly, as far as what it gets me um, on earth, this is not a job for me. This is a calling. A job is something you get paid for. I believe and I, I'm believing God that one day God is going to open up the windows of heaven to where financially we will be able to, to sustain a salary for me. But if, if God never opens up that door, I will continue to do the work that God has sent me to do because God has called me to do it. I am more concerned about us, not just me. I'm here to give a word of, of, of redemption. I'm here to give a word of salvation. I'm here to give a word of encouragement. I am here to give a word of chastisement. I'm here to give whatever word God gives me to give you because it's not about me. 
It's not about me. It's all about God. It's all about you. Everything is all about you, which is why I'm saying share this word. Put this word out there. Somebody needs to know that Jesus Christ loves them. And if you don't share this word, this daily bread, this our bread, give us our bread, but you're the only one eating it. How many of you all, I've asked, please, please share this word. If this word is a good word of God, if this word is, is, is completely in the scriptures, if I haven't went outside of the scriptures to do anything, then if this is the word of God, then why are we not sharing our word of God? Why are we not sharing our daily bread for us? How many people are starving today? I look at uh, across the world, uh, there are always uh, these different campaigns to feed the hungry. All of the different campaigns to, to feed all of the little orphans and, and all of the people over in Africa. And they would always show these people in Africa who had pot bellies or, or you could see their little rib cages and the bugs flying all around them. And, and, and they would ask us to donate uh, just seven cents a day. You know, or, or, or $20 a month, 70 cents a day, whatever the amount was. But the idea was that we wanted to feed those people who are hungry. Well, brothers and sisters, let me tell you that people in the world are hungry for the truth. They want the truth. They don't want your spin on it. They want the truth. I don't, I don't understand how the world that we live in... Uh, there are so many people who have the itching ears and, and, and they, they, they want a lie, but then they also want the truth. The, the Democrats are, are looking for truth. The Republicans are looking for truth. But the truth is not in our government. The truth is in Jesus Christ. If we actually wanted the truth, then we wouldn't need Democrats and we wouldn't need Republicans. We would only need the word of God. But how many people that we know of are starving for the truth? Just like all of those people in foreign countries and third world countries and even in the United States who go to bed hungry every day, there are more people who are going to bed hungry for the word than those who are hungry for uh, not eating physical food. There are more sinners in the world. There are more people who don't have Christ as their Lord and Savior than there are people who don't have physical food. The Bible tells us when, when we are on our way to heaven that there are more people who don't have uh transportation, if you will, to heaven. It says that the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow, but you will find very few people on it. But the road that leads to destruction, the road that leads to destruction is wide and it is overcrowded. Those people that ate some regular food, but they haven't had the bread of life. They are still Dying even though they are living. It is our job to find these people who are dying. We are the nurses of the world. We are the doctors of the world. It is our job to nurse them to health with the word of God. It is our job to nourish them to every day. You can't just put a band-aid on some, somebody had surgery. You don't put them in a hospital and leave them there. You check on them every day. You take their temperature. You give them medicine. You, you nourish them back to health. It's not just a one-day thing. You take care of them on a daily basis. Our job as Christians is to find those who are sick and lost and, and, and nourish them to health on a daily basis. Many of us have people who we know are, are living a sin sick existence it is our job to give them life it is our job to give them the word of God 
How many times should we go to them? If an individual has wronged us, how many times should we forgive them? And while we forgive them, don't just forgive them, but restore them. Bring them back to the place of restoration. Oh, I'm going to forgive them. I'll forgive you, but I'm going to forget you. I'm going to forgive you, but I'm going to keep you at a distance. Forgiveness actually restores. To, to forgive says that I'm going to put you in the place that you were prior to the incident. So you cannot tell me that you forgive me, but still keep me at arm's length. That's not forgiveness. And if that's what you, you have been doing, then you need to ask God to forgive you. And remember, when you ask God to forgive you, hopefully you don't ask God to forgive you, but keep you at an arm's length. Now, that's 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 one of our next uh, verses where we talks about forgive us our debts as we forgive the debtors. We don't want to. Excuse me. Every time I start talking about the prayer, I get sleepy. I'm telling you all, it's a mind thing. Don't allow the devil to control your mind. Up here starts everything everything that we do even when the, when when the body has a stroke there is a part of the brain that stops working when that part of the brain stops working it tells whatever part of your body the left side the right side when you have a stroke your brain have stopped working and it tells a part of your body it does not work even though it was working just minutes before the brain is very powerful so please forgive me uh, for, for all of the yawning, it, it doesn't mean that I'm bored with you. I'm, I'm not bored at all, and I'm not really terribly sleepy. Uh, it's just when I begin to, to say that prayer, it's usually my bedtime prayer. And uh, when I say it, my mind puts me in the place of it must be bedtime. So uh, please forgive me. I, I hope you all understand. Uh, Aisha, stop laughing at me. Okay. Uh, anyway, as we talk about this, and, and, and asking God to forgive us for this day. Don't let today finish before you give somebody else the word of God. What, what, what are we giving them? We are giving them forgiveness. We are giving them nutrition. We are giving them love. We are giving them acceptance. All of the things that God gives to us. Now, somebody you might need to give chastisement to remember that those he love he chastises so when you chastise somebody it doesn't mean that you don't love them as a matter of fact according to the word of god it means that you do love them you want to see them corrected <coughs> chastisement is not about uh you getting even it's not about making yourself feel good about getting them back for the wrong that they did you that's not chastisement. That's called revenge. And remember that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. What God wants us to give is chastisement for the purpose of correction. Let us try to love people and love them in a way that, that we are able to give them correction because that's what God wants from us. He corrects us because he loves us and then he wants us because he did correct us, because he loves us, he wants us to do the exact same thing, correct somebody else because we love them. I need to take a quick pause. This is the opportunity that, that we usually uh, speak to you on offerings. Brothers and sisters, believe me, we, we are in, in need of your financial support. Uh, we are going to take somewhat of a hit uh, because of what just occurred on Sunday uh, the Bible says we have not because we ask not or because we act selfishly. I'm asking on behalf of New Jerusalem to please give and give generously. Uh, all offerings tonight will go for the purpose of this $2,500 to $3,500 mishap that we just had. Uh, we don't know what it's going to cost to have to go into the ceiling, cut out a part of the ceiling, replace that uh that pipe that burst replaced the drywall, all of the, the, the cost of the cleanup and, and um, whatever we're going to have to do uh, to replace the, the electrical fixtures and, and all of that. Uh, we, we know that somewhere between 2500 to possibly 3500 
So we're asking all of those that will give in tonight's offering, give with this in mind as we are going to have this uh, new sustainable bill that we're going to have to deal with. And believe me, I know that God is going to provide. Now, I'm not asking you not to give because I know that God is going to provide. I'm saying that uh, whether you give or not, my trust and my faith is in our Lord Jesus. He has promised to sustain us. He already told us, don't worry about it. He's going to take care of it. He already know what we have need of. So I know that God is going to do that. But I also have to remember that uh, we have not because we ask not. So I'm just letting you know for you to have an opportunity to be blessed. Uh, if you want to give via the cash app, uh, the to give is the dollar sign New Jerusalem 1977. If you want to send an offering through the mail, you can do so. Uh, you can do it to uh, New Jerusalem or NJNBC, number one North Dade, D-A-D-E, Ferguson, Missouri, 63135. For those who may have uh, Zelle, the, the giving app, there's an app called Zelle, Z-E-L-L-E. -E. You can also give uh, at, uh, if you put in New Jerusalem or uh, the, the email address that you might need to give is uh, New Jerusalem MBC 1977 at gmail.com or if it asks for a phone number the phone number associated with the account is 314-368-7378 great thank you so much appreciate you giving uh, I want to get back to this word that that is uh, that has truly been sustaining us for today uh, Giving us today the bread of life, we are knowing that every day if God is going to give us this bread, bread is not going to run out. If the bread is not going to run out, then something else that I, 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 I'm just looking at my notes, uh, this, this scripture also brings us out of fear. If God gives me what I need every day, then I don't have fear that he is not going to give me what I need for tomorrow. There is no fear that tomorrow is not going to come for me or what I need tomorrow is not going to come. So, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, many of us are driven every day by fear. And God wants to alleviate us of that fear. If we know that God has what we need every day, then the fear of not having a loved one, not having uh, uh, food for tomorrow, not having enough money for tomorrow, not having a job for tomorrow, uh, brothers and sisters, the scripture says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God has not forsaken us. He has not forsaken you. Now, I'm not saying that there are not a lot of people right now in this day and age that's not hungry. We see food lines and, and, and uh, food trucks and all of these kind of things all over the place. But that doesn't have to be you. Not as a believer in Christ. There are a lot of believers who are hungry. But I believe, this is my belief, more Christians are hungry because they don't have enough belief in the word of God. They have lost faith that God is going to supply for them. I heard a man on the radio today said that Jesus is his recruiter and God is his employer. And what he was saying was, I know that uh, I'm going to get my, my, uh, my job. I, I know that if this job goes away, that Jesus is out recruiting for me and God is going to make sure that I get a job. But later on in the show, 
when when this lady said that God gave her an idea and she used that idea and he asked her, well, what if nobody else believes in your idea? This is the same person who said that Jesus was going to sustain him and that God was going to make sure that he was employed. If God gave an individual a thought or a plan, you don't think that God is going to, to give them who to give that plan to or that somebody else is going to see that plan and, and want to get involved with it. So often we, we, we say things that sound good, but our speech betrays us. Many of us are saying, yes, I trust God, but if you trust God, then you should have no fear that God is going to take care of your today and your tomorrow. God have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if God doesn't want us to have fear, then why are so many of us living in fear and, and we fear what we truly don't understand and many of us don't understand the concept of tomorrow. There are so many people who truly don't know whether or not there is a heaven or hell, but they live by rolling the dice and, and what they're saying is, I'm going to, I'm going to accept Christ uh, not so much because I believe, but because I'm afraid that if I don't believe the alternative. Brothers and sisters, that's not really living. When you are living based on fear, <coughs> then you have not given yourself to your full potential, your full capability. We have to know that, that God is, is giving us everything that we need. God is giving us everything that he has. God has given us, the earth belongs to God and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. And the Bible says that once we have accepted Christ, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We are going to share in what God has left for his son. And because now I have accepted Christ. That God now is my father. I am a child of God. I am the brother of Christ. I am the joint heir. Of God. I hope you understand what all of that means. That means I'm not worried. About tomorrow. I don't worry about what what's going to happen to me. Uh, I, I, I told a friend of mine today that I love the home that God has given us, but I believe that God is going to give us a better house. Uh, uh, what, what we want to consider as our forever home. But I'm looking forward to what God is going to do for us. Why? Because I'm not fearing, even in this pandemic, I'm not fearing tomorrow. I'm not fearing... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to say this, but I want everybody to be confronted by their own thought process. There are some people who have said in regards to the vaccination, whether they would take it or whether they would not take it. Uh, I believe that God is going to cover us and God is going to keep us safe. But uh, I also have made the determination that I probably will go and get the vaccination. One of my kids said, Dad, I don't think you should get it. There's a lot of people who are worried about it or whatever. What the Bible says for us not to worry, to be anxious for nothing. So if, if I'm not going to be anxious for anything but through prayer and supplication, make my request known. And then the Bible says that if I take any deadly thing, it will not harm me. We don't know what is, is, is in all of these different quote-unquote vaccinations that we're taking. We're, we're talking about the, the COVID vaccination, but you don't know what's, what's, what's all in your flu shot. You don't know what's all in your TB shot. You don't know what's all in your typhoid shot. You don't know what's all in any kind of shot. As a matter of fact, unless you are a doctor and the doctor who put it all together and ingested it, you can only hope that the shot they are giving you is the shot that they're supposed to be giving you. I cannot live by fear. I'm not fearing COVID and I'm not fearing the vaccine. Every day I go out into a world that COVID is killing people. If, I, if I'm not going to be afraid of the disease, then I'm also not going to be afraid 
of the vaccination. Now, I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm telling you based on me. I'm out in the world frequently doing the jobs and then I have to come home to my family who's not out as much. I want to make sure that I am not going to be a conduit of any kind of disease. My daughters are, are spraying me down with Lysol when I come in the house. I got to cover up my eyes so that I don't get burnt uh, with Lysol spray. Well, I would rather know that I'm not in a position of bringing them anything that I have to get sprayed any further. So uh, I, I'm saying that because we're, we're talking about fear and living in fear. I don't want you to live in fear, nor do I want my family or myself to live in fear. When we are talking to God about giving us today our daily bread, I want you to know that we are actually talking in faith and faith dispels fear. If I'm believing that God is going to give me everything that I need, then there is no fear of lack. I believe that God is going to take care of me. I believe that God is going to take care of my family. I believe that as a child of God, I am entitled to the good things that God have. He said, no good thing will he withhold. And if he's not going to withhold the good things, then that means you can have the good things. But also that means you need to be working. You have to work for the things. Uh, uh, not that it, it, it's all about what you do. But the Bible, if you don't work, you don't eat. And one thing that God's hate is a sluggard who refuses to plow. That's what we have to do. We have to plow. There's a message that I preached many, uh, many years ago. Uh, for every promise, there is a plow. God is promising us a good life. He has promised us uh, that we would be able to live more than conquerors. We are being able to have the more abundant life. But for everything that he promised us, we have a job to do. We have a plow that we have to push. Remember the Lord your God who's given you the power to get wealth so that his covenant be, can be established. I'm, I'm supposed to pay my tithes and my offering. Uh, so, hey, I'm believing and trusting God for my 10%, my 20%, my 30% that I'm going to sow into the kingdom. But that 70% that's left, God is saying I can do with that what I will. So why not take that 80% that or 85% or 70% or however much you keep after your tithes and offering, why can't you have a good life with that? Why can't you have uh, the, 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 the fine home or car or uh, boat or yacht or airplane, jet, uh, helicopter, whatever it is you choose or what, whatever it is that you want. And if you want... Uh, a small car, then to God be the glory. But if you want a big car, don't let anybody else tell you that you can't have it because it's not God's will for your life. I do believe that it is. Beloved, I wish above all that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Uh, to my brother and my friend, Pastor Michael Franks, he said, Pastor, I always enjoy uh, watching and your teaching. Brother, I enjoy you. I enjoy the love that our family share uh, greetings to New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, to the entire New Salem and Frank's family. We love you all. Thank you so much for joining in with us. Uh, brothers and sisters, I hope that this have, have been something good for you. I hope that you've gotten something about our daily bread. If nothing else, remember every day, acknowledge God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your path. I hope that God uh, uh, will give you the opportunity uh, to, to read his word on a daily basis. That's how you acknowledge him. And then the word of God, the bread of life, he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God, that daily bread, give us this day. Lord, give me today the word of God for today. Give me the word of God that's going to impact my life today so that I can be impactful to somebody else's life. If you have any questions, problems, prayer requests, please submit them to us. Give us the opportunity. Hopefully you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If not, and you want to know more about Jesus Christ, my brother and my Savior, send us a message. 
Give us the opportunity to, to love on you and to allow Jesus Christ to speak into your life. God bless you. God keep you as our prayers. Good night.